two kids from Queens, cut from a different cloth. Now, joining forces, helping you to elevate your personal brand. Yeah, I'm talking about Nikki and Moose, bringing you a never before seen perspective into the mindset, the mentality, the behaviors, the driving force, but more importantly, the stories behind the people and brands that you know and love the most. What's poppin', what's poppin', what's poppin'? Welcome to Nikki and Moose. I'm Nikki. That's Moose. What's up, Moose? What up? How and are you? I'm, I'm good. How are you? Very good. Oh, okay. I don't know what you're reaching for, but okay. He's like, very good. Um, Shout out to everybody who's in the building. Shout out to the the YouTube uh, viewership. I'm going to take the Joe Button line. Shout out to the YouTube viewership. You're not. For all my Facebook people, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube, I need you to go do that. Um, Moose, it's a special day. Awesome. Special oh, day. I, I'm, I'm just excited to be a part of this because I know how... Uh, impactful this has been for you mm -hmm. and i'm like okay yep it's uh this is gonna be history in the making absolutely absolutely listen we are going to be talking about the late great nip put the the uh marathon flags up all you want to do is put that that's all i want to see i don't want to see anything else but the marathon flags um let's just get into the intro i just want to get right into it make sure you share this make sure you comment all that great stuff let's get into the intro In, in, introduce my man introduce because I, I could go on a rant so i'm gonna let you introduce and we're just gonna go into these lessons because if anybody knows me they know i can go about nip so you started off so we can stay on course yeah i mean many many different titles right artist rapper producer entrepreneur real estate mogul tech investor uh worthy of all of the accolades honestly i i've definitely been more educated through this process just about what he stood for and man you talk about making a difference in a community uh trusting your timing and just really sticking through it making contributions on a consistent basis like pretty much many of the lessons that we've talked about being authentic yeah the list goes on and on but yeah nipsey hustle back so look we're gonna start it off like we normally do Right. Let me let me put them up. Right. Um, what do you think Nipsey is? Is he a pilot, a flight attendant, grounds crew or air traffic controller? Moose in a minute and 30. Can you let the people know what's what? Absolutely. So the flight assessment is based on uh, our extreme execution program, where we talk about the four dominant personality types that exist in the world. So uh, we talk about the flight assessment because it's the one place where all four of these dominant styles have to work together for a successful flight, right? For a successful experience. So first we start off with the pilot. This is the person who, of course, is flying the plane. They are the leader. They're out front. They're making sure that you know, they get the plane from where it is to its final destination. So those who resonate with this style, they're usually more uh, driven, decisive, determined. They like challenges. They're like go-getters and hustlers. Then next you have the flight attendant, right? They are a lot more friendly. They're people oriented. They love to help you out, make you smile. They get their energy from being around you. They're just life of the party. Anything that revolves around people, that's what they want to do. They care deeply about relationships. Once you sit in your seat, you look out the window, usually you see some folks in green, orange vest, blue vest, depending what airline you're flying. Those are your grounds crew members. They're putting bags onto the plane. They're bringing up snacks and beverages up for the flight attendant. 
right? They play an intricate part of the role. So they're more like, hey, whatever you need me to do, I'm there to support you and help you get it done. So involved in many different places, you don't hear them as much, but again, play a critical role into the experience. And last but not least, just before the plane takes off, you hear from people uh, in the towers where the pilots going through the intercom telling you, yep, we uh, are next, you know, according to air traffic control, we got two planes ahead of us, we'll be taking off. So air traffic control, these are the people who are all about the systems. They uh, are a lot more calculated. They want to make sure things are going according to the plan. They're planners, you know, things of that nature. So they run strategy. They want to make sure things get done right first time. So I see a lot of see a lot of pilots, see the uh, flight attendants. Let's just get into it because that we had a convers a slight conversation of this should be very interesting. So, um, oh, yeah. all right, let me set this up. So, this is not going to go so much on his music, but more on a clearly branding and business side, uh, how much of a marketing genius he was, how he thought of being an empire more than anything. So we're going to kind of point out those specific things, but let's get into this uh, mixtape that got a lot of people talking um, and where he got it from and everything like that. So let's set this up. I don't ever make moves under pressure. I try not to. On, on Crenshaw, I've said this is gonna be the first time I give my fan base a directive and say, if you wanna reciprocate for the inspiration that I've given you over the course of these five mixtapes, here's how you do it, proud to pay. It's a hundred dollar CD, come to the pop-up shop. So you know I had one over enough people that we sold out the first thousand in the first day. My whole intention was just get the people talking about it. I want everybody to you know, be like, why is he charging a hundred? What make you think it's worth a hundred? So. Uh, that was the Crenshaw mixtape, right? So kind of a backstory and, and Moose could go a little bit more detail into it. He read a book called Contagious, right? And, uh, he got the idea from a hundred dollar mixtape from a hundred dollar cheese steak, right? Uh, I, what, Moose, what was it called? Like Prime? Do you remember that one? It was like Prime. No, I know I know it was out of Philly, but I'm not sure. Okay, so the there name. was a spot out of Philly that sold $100 cheesesteaks, right? And thinking outside of the box, the book said, you know what, it got people talking. Normally, cheesesteaks are like $4, $5, something around there. But you charge an insane amount of money, and people are going to be like, what? Why? Like, what's what's going on, Right. So he read it and he put that in play with the mixtape. Now he knew the music industry was changing into streaming. Like people could still hear his music for free, but in the digital world, he was like, you know what? Let's still um, give the fans a way to support me in some kind of way. So I'm gonna do a pop-up shop. I'm gonna print out a thousand copies right? And I'm going to sell for a hundred dollars. Why? Because in his mind, he was like, I got to make a uh, hundred K off of this. Right. And so that got a lot of people talking, but it got one person in particular, uh, talking about it and buying it. Right. And that was Jay-Z. And once Jay-Z bought it game over, that thing sold out like crazy Moose, I know you, you, uh, got some notes about the book and kind of the, the strategy behind it. I would love to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I love what he says in that clip. It's he's, he's put out five mixtapes before. Mm -hmm. and he said, if you want to repay me for, you know, all the inspiration and things that I've done in the community, here's your opportunity to show up and do that. So when you look at it from a pricing model, right? Yes. Number one, he knows his customer very well because he's speaking to a specific demographic, but also he had a body of work that was already produced. He had made deposits into the community that when you come out and you say, Hey, you know, here's, here's what I'm doing. Uh, it, it wasn't out of the world or out of the ordinary to see, Oh, okay. It's a premium, but 
it's an opportunity for me to repay you. And I know you talk about this, you know, with some of your work in terms mm -hmm. of going live Monday through Friday, constantly giving, 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 giving. When you put out a product or a service, people are running regardless of the price point pretty much because it's like, yo, if let's just pretend that I divided that money up over the last however many weeks or months that you've been able to help me. So mm -hmm. it's that similar concept here. When you make deposits into your community over an extended period of time and it's consistent quality work that has moved the needle and impacted their lives, when it's time for you to roll out and you have an initiative or an agenda behind it, you're going to get people to respond. And the reason why he rolled out at that price point and specifically a thousand, it's because that's how much money he needed to start his record label. Mm. Mm. So, um, this is the thing. <laughs> a lot of the things that I, I could admit that a lot of things that I do is t completely inspired by what Nip does. Because you have to, just like Moose said, you have to look at the the industry and how people in the music industry have to give away free music, whether it's through mixtapes, whether it's the streaming and everything like that. Nothing is tangible anymore, right? So when... Thinking about that, he's like, you know what? I want to give as much as I can to my fans, right? But I do, uh, I, I still got to make a business of some way, right? And not only did he think of it like that, he was like, if this model works, I could do this for other artists. So he kind of tested it out first on himself with, all right, let's do this uh, proud to pay campaign, right? So he started off um, with a thousand copies at a hundred, a hundred dollars, right? Then uh, mailbox money, which came out later, was only a hundred copies for a thousand dollars. Still the same price point of I got to make a hundred k, right? And the the crazy part is that sold as well. Right. When you add so much value, when you give so much, people are going to support it. Right. And, and we'll get more into like just as far as Nip as a community person. Right. What he's done with the culture and everything like that. But taking your skills and your product. Right. And putting an insane price to it is going to make people talk, is going to make people wonder, is it worth it, right? For those who may be just a warm audience or just hearing about you, but the hot audience, the people who's been rocking with you, the core, it, and as you saw in that video, they were all lined up. There's no question that I'll pay $100 for a mixtape because you've given me so much prior to that that $100 isn't nothing. Like you, and in his way, he was speaking to uh, a certain age group, a certain culture, um, people of his generation, and even some older than him, vibed out with him and was like, yo, you've added so much to me because of you just telling your truth. And so you look at that and you're like, yo, if, if Nip can do that, if literally words, and I call music literally selling air, right? And if Nip can sell air, a, a, a story, a digital story, right? And somehow make it into a physical product or a place of being able to support it, why are some of you struggling to figure out a price point for what you do? Like there wasn't a value point issue or anything like that. Mixtapes were free or $5 at the time, right? Depending where you go. $5 are free. And he created a proud to pay campaign off of things that you could get for free. He was like, yo, for those people who, who rock with me, but not like that, you can still get it off of the regular places that you get your stuff, right? 
But for those who, who want to support, who want to come out and everything like that, boom, $100. And people didn't hesitate. Moose, what do you think, pe why do you think people struggle with creating products that has a certain price point where Nip was just like, I got inspired by a book, boom, I'm going to do $100. Yeah, yeah, I think... A lot of times, man, it's when you don't have the confidence to put out a product or put your price point at a certain level, really it's because you have not been doing enough practice. I realized that confidence specifically for business owners and brands, it comes from practice. Mm -hmm. When you're doing the work and you're involved in producing product, producing content, working your business, right? Working your strategy or that which you feel you've mastered and you need others to know. You're pushing a vision and a message out to the world. You are when you really walk and practice that, it becomes easy for you to, at least easier, I should say, for you to relay that message to other people in a unique way. Mm -hmm. And understand that branding, marketing really is just this concept of let me translate what I feel or what I want someone to walk away with in a way that grabs their attention. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what every person does, it almost trains or creates the behavior of your audience. So if you come out the gate, right, notice, five mixtapes in, he's added a lot of value, he's created this concept of community and inspiration, and he's connecting with people through the story of those who grew up in the neighborhood, right, or grew up in Cali on the West Coast. They really are resonating with the story. So now he's training your behavior to recognize that when I put out a premium product, that's normal. By what does he do? Proud to pay. Mm -hmm. Right. So like he didn't call it too expensive, right? Mm -hmm. he, he didn't put out that type of message. He really correlated a, or created a message that would get his audience, his people to start responding to him in a way that's like, oh, whether they know it or not, he's training our behavior to begin to respond to his products, his services in that way. So ultimately, it's this concept of when confidence confidence is lacking, it's because there's not enough practice. And know that with every move that you do with your business or your brand, you are training the audience to behave a certain way with you, right? Whether it be their spending habits, whether it be their their ways of supporting you, whichever way it is, you know, you're ultimately kind of training those habits or engraving those habits within them. And that, that was so good. And I didn't even want to put a, a air horn because that was so good. I just wanted that to resonate with people for, for real. But um, what was crazy is that by he, this is the how strategic he was, right? So because of the hundred dollars, he was able and this was back then, right? He was able to collect the database of everybody who bought as well the mixtapes, right? Uh, shout out to the text gang um, and tech squad. Like back then, he knew the importance of catering to your core audience, catering to your core supporters, and keeping them in a database that is being able to have direct communication because when he did these different campaigns, he was able to send out the information directly to them. And that's why he got the results that he did, right? This wasn't just a, um, you know, a typical artist. He had a strategy with everything. You know what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do these different types of mixtapes. I'm going to do this different type of campaign. I'm going to send it out directly to my supporters. They're going to buy it. I know with record labels and the streaming and everything like that, things aren't the same, but I have to have control. And the greatest thing about it is that he owned his masters. So he didn't necessarily need the machine, AKA the record label, like many others. He literally all, all he needed was his fans and supporters and he needed a, a direct communication to get to that. Right. And so flipping that for people is like, yo, do you have that direct communication for your fans, followers, clients, whatever it is. Right. Because 
without that, how do they know what's going out? Are you solely depending on social media? Because back then it was, it was starting to become popular, but he still had a direct communication. He st whether it was email or, or text messages, he had a database back then of, mm -hmm. yo, I, I need to get to my people because everything that they buy, everything that they support is coming directly back to my family. I don't need to pay this person, that person. It has to go all the way back, right? He was big on ownership and we'll get into that with the whole mailbox money and everything. But I want people to start thinking, yo, am I putting enough value out there that I can just charge whatever I want and people have no problem doing uh, paying for that? And do I have a direct way to connect with my uh, fans and followers? If not, that's one of the key switches that you got to do right now. Because if social media was to crash, how are you going to talk to your people? How are you going to talk to your tribe? How are you going to talk to your clients? Like he knew the importance of not only catering, but communicating. So Moose, I didn't know if you wanted to say something about that, but. Yeah, no, fire concept. Your concept. Quick question though, actually, for you. What's that? Do, do you think um like modern day using the text messages or the community concept mm -hmm. is the way to pull have direct that direct communication? Mm -hmm. is, ah. is that okay? So um in a interview um that he did with Big Boy, he was he was expressing the text community, and this was like in what 2000. 15, 17, something around there, right? Um, before everybody really caught on, right? And what is great about the text community, uh, if you do it right, is just pure communication and them getting to know you a bit better, right? You getting to say, uh, you get notifications when it's their birthday, you know, um, you can make them feel exclusive by showing them certain things first, giving them first dibs, giving them access to only this and nobody else gets it, right? It's creating a, a, uh, an exclusive feel just through your phone and not relying on, on social media algorithm to possibly show it, right? And right. he did that and sold thousands and thousands of units just because he had direct communication. And if people was to just figure out that direct communication, however they feel that that, that is, whether it's email and text messaging or however, uh, messenger bots, however you feel like you need to do it, if you was to really structure that out, Anything you drop, you will sell. It will convert because the people that come into that have already taken an extra step compared to uh, followers, right? That's just a, another leap of, okay, I trust you enough to have my phone number. I trust you enough to have my email. I trust you enough to have more of a direct communication. They're trusting you enough not to abuse it. And if you play right. it right, you could sell you could sell out a shirt, you could sell out a program, you could sell out a book, an event, whatever you do, if you play it right, a lot of people do that wrong. They do it completely wrong. They spam you out. Or they don't even really um give you content that even makes you feel that there's a point of being in this direct communication. All they keep doing is telling you when they're they're dropping something, and that's it. I'm not getting anything back for this. Now, granted, I do want to feel like I have notifications and everything cool, but there's a whole strategy around it by, yo, here. And he did this, and now I might be jumping in, so that's why I need your help, because I will go. Um, yeah, yeah. He, he did this with the store, and we'll get into that a little bit, but yeah, the direct communication and text messaging and everything is super key right now. Uh, if you play it right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think in short, only thing to add, it's like, it seems that every level of business 
cut out the middleman. It's mm-hmm. like if you can have that, you know, A to Z, just no middleman involved. And it seems like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whichever platform is your platform right now, that technically is the middleman or even in this case, the dis- the distribution center because they control who sees your stuff and who doesn't see it. Where once you convert people to have direct access, yep, I see what you're saying. Good stuff. All right, let's get into this next clip. I liked it a lot because it talked about what do you do in the beginning? Like when just starting and you don't have much, what is some of the things that you do? Even you work with what you got, man. I was never a robber. I was always a hustler. Mm -hmm. And what I I say that is that you can watch what other people doing and this nigga on this level of the game and it'll start poisoning your process and you want to skip steps oh i can't do nothing let me go just rush to somebody for some help work within the realm of which you got access to and i was mixtapes yeah and when i didn't have the internet or no fan base that cared we was out the trunk with it you know Tracks. and so i just believe in being you know embracing what you got around you you know and as your resources grow level up but it's never no excuse to not work mm. Moose. i love that I love that. I love that. And you know what's so dope is that when you watch his documentary, one of the things that you'll notice about Nipsey is that he was really who he says he is. Right. When they say out the trunk. Yeah, that's pretty much how they started. Like him and his brother, Black Sam, they were selling T-shirts and socks on a table right on the curb. Mm-hmm. Like that. that's really how they started. So you talk about resourcefulness. It stretches back to his childhood, right? Got his first job in the sixth grade, polishing shoes and and worked on commission. So notice how we talk about programming a lot and how some of your experiences almost shape how you navigate the world. So he's already first job on commission, not an hourly rate, not a flat rate. So I think it it, it begins to give him that almost advantage of like, hey, this is how you got to move. Look for opportunities that pay you based on your contribution and your efforts as opposed to just settling for a flat rate. And I think taking that model, he just continued to build on it and found his way back to, you know, this this opportunity with, with what he's built. Yeah, and, and what I'll say about it is like everything that Nip did uh, from the beginning to the end was something that he invested in, right? So you mentioned the whole, uh, with him and his brother selling the shirts and everything. Um, He, if, and talking about that same documentary, on the corner of the Marathon Clothing where unfortunately that he got murdered and everything like that, where it all started was, like Moose said, a table, shirts, socks, and it got, Rated, well, not rated. The cops came, took it away like about three times, right? And the last time, he it was a black cop and he was like, Yo, wh- what, what's the situation? Like, why, why, why are you not, why are you keep coming here and taking our stuff? And he's like, You see over there, why don't you do what the legal way of doing it? Lease it, rent it, make yourself official, right? And they took it and everything. Right. At that point, they rented out a spot. They called this Lawson's Tees. They sold everything as far as merchandise there, music, everything. Right. When it came to the music side, Nip didn't pay for an engineer, didn't pay for studio. Like he used what he had and he used his friend, Jay Stone, to engineer. So. When Jay Stone was rapping, he was engineering for Jay Stone. When Nip was rapping, it was flipped, right? Because they had to work with what they had. So he was producing, engineering, everything like that just to get started, right? He didn't wait for too many people. He figured it out. He he worked with what he had, whether it was uh, selling the shirts outside or whether it was engineering and creating the music himself, selling it all that great stuff, he worked with what he had. And a lot of people, just like he said, just stand still and wait for opportunities and wait for certain equipment and wait. Like there was another clip that, um, and that had to be in like 
2007, like early 2000s, he was like, yo, we're just in a day and age where if you have a message, if you have a story, it doesn't take a $10,000 camera anymore. What's being recorded is probably a $200 camera. And that's all you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need the flashy, flashy lights. You don't need the record labels. You don't need a, a huge influencer with a platform anymore. You can be that influencer. You just got to put things out there. And he showed step by step of doing it yourself and having ownership with everything. Because if I'm going to do it myself, I'm going, I'm not going to give you a dime. There's no point. And, and and people wait, and that's why they get into certain situations where they don't own some of their stuff because they waited for those particular opportunities or they waited for uh, their resources and tools. And so they became dependent on that where Nip didn't become dependent on anybody. He was like, I have a, sh a small circle and I'm going to work with these people only and we're going to make everything happen. I'm going to reinvest in everything that I do. If my passion is music at this point, I'm going to get everything that I can through uh, touring, through merchandise, everything like that. And I'm going to reinvest it into other things to create this empire. So to see that clip and this sh and the fact that he said, yo, literally work with what I have. He didn't want to copy typical mixtapes would take um, beats from uh what is it? Uh, Billboard uh, songs, producer. right? Yeah. Billboard songs and and recreate them as their own. And he said, nah, I'm, I'm, we're going to do all grassroots um, beats. That's all I'm going to be doing. I'm not I don't I'm not going to be a copy of anybody else. I can't do it. If you're going to hear my music, it's going to be of original beats and original bars. And do you, if you flip that into to branding and, and, and the business kind of thing, we try to start and copy other people with their style, with their content, with their websites, exactly what it is, where he did, I'm not copying nobody. I'm going to work with what I have and I'm going to be as original as I can. And the, hence why his impact was so large because he paved the way of to do it how you want to do it do it original way and not what other people are doing so okay let me stop let, let me stop that's powerful. No, that's powerful. Let me stop. yeah that's that's so good though that's so good because you know why like to bring it back even to the flight assessment mm -hmm. you listen to how he's talk how he's talking and you can't help but think that man there's some air traffic control tendencies there, right? That that systematic, really thinking through your moves. Yeah. But I also noticed that he's on the side of mastery mm -hmm. with his air traffic control or how he moves and navigates his strategy because he is pursuing perfection, but he recognizes that perfection doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So when it does not go according to plan, or when it's not as perfect as he wants it to be, he's okay with being resourceful, pivoting, or making a move to still get something done. So that's where I recognize some people can also fall victim or just get stuck and dig themselves in a hole because they're pursuing perfectionism and they think that it actually exists when in reality, it doesn't. You know what I'm saying? So like just for him continuing to be resourceful, I thought it, it's, so, it's so refreshing to see and it kind of, it, it brings back that belief in just modern day, like it doesn't have to be perfect. As a matter of fact, people connect more when it's not perfect, when it's not so staged. Like you look at what's happening right now and, and what you're doing with even the the, the Instagram reels, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's it's not anything that is super high definition, but it is very refreshing. It's very original, it's super creative, and people are able to consume it, learn from it, and use it in tad bit sizes whether it be, I even took some stuff for you, like the hashtag apps, you know, it's like, right, right. It's, it's cool though, but it's, but it's that concept of, yo, you, it's okay to pursue it. Just don't think that it actually exists, right? You have to be willing to kind of modify and adjust. So, okay. Well, can you help the people who, who struggle with the perfection kind of vibes? Because I know like people set bars 
in their head of what certain things are supposed to be, whether it is my business has to have the logo, website, all that before I even start doing this, or my stuff has to look a certain kind of way before I put it out. Like, where do you think this imaginary bar comes from? Yeah, so I know where the bar comes from, and it's when you care deeply about your image, because I was that person. I was someone who cared deeply about my image and my last name because I put so much time into everything that I do mm -hmm. that when I put it out there, I wanted to represent the time, the effort, and the energy, even the care that I have about the product, the service itself, or mm -hmm. the people that it's going to serve. So in my mind, all right, let me let me put more, let me do a little bit more. But then you recognize that if your product, service, business, whichever it is that you do doesn't get out to the people, then the very thing that you're trying to do, you're robbing them from, right? Because if the goal is to help them, is to serve them, is to make them better, but it's not out there for them to consume, then it never gets there. And then of course, just in what we've built over the last you know, 18 months or having a role to play with extreme execution, right. you're talking about building, building a seven figure arm, not because we started at seven figures, but because we made, we made improvements. We kept making, said, wait a minute, we wait, wait a minute. Yep. I'm Welcome. telling you, I'm hmm. telling you. So, so how do you help? How do you start getting over perfection? Start being okay with making improvements, recognizing that version one is not going to be the one that I want ideally, but you know what? Version two is going to be a little bit closer. Okay. You know what? Product number two isn't exactly what I want my brand to be a representation of, but product number three will be a uh, program. Number four will get me a little bit closer. And if you just keep pursuing that concept of improvement, that's when it starts to really click for you because you have it really, I don't want to say the word twisted, but I think the word twisted belongs here. You have it really backwards, if you will, if you think that one thing is going to be the, the path to eternity. It just doesn't work that way. Not in today's society, not in today's business world. Congratulations. You played yourself. That was for the people. That wasn't for Moose. That was for the people. <laughs> All right. All right, let's let, let's keep this moving because we can stay here. I promise you we can on pretty much all these topics. So um, I want to talk about catalog and body of work, right? Um, and how important it is to keep working and, and keep creating uh, regardless of the obstacles, regardless of how you feel later down the road things will work out. So let me, before I get too much into it, let's just get me into it. Confused about it. And I remember like questioning everything like, damn, I don't, I don't really had no part of the game that braced me for that. I don't have no mantras that I remember hearing. Or nothing <laughs> right, I, grew up right. around. Yeah. I ain't had no answer for that one. <laughs> but you know, it kind of discouraged me for a long time. And, but I had accumulated so much music. But I, from, from when I got rated, I stopped really recording every day and got back into hustling full time because I'm like, I gotta fight a case now and I need a lawyer and yeah. I can't even really afford to sit in the studio like that. And um, probably like six months to a year later, uh, a person named Johnny Shipes, he was he was uh, an executive at Epic Records. He had a joint venture up there at Epic, reached out and um, he took songs off my MySpace and played them for Epic Records. They wanted to sign me off the old music and put a contract on the table and broke bread with me and it was all off old work and i realized like damn this is back pay so uh for those who were a little bit lost in the beginning um nip when he took the music serious right he had several different obstacles with his store getting raided to his brother going uh serving time to uh you know, shutting down of the studios and all this crazy stuff, right? That got him very discouraged, which happens to a lot of us, not necessarily maybe all those different things, but as far as obstacles that are going to actually like push us back, like, man, what is, what is the point of this, right? 
But he admitted like, yo, I thought this was going to, it was the second that I came pure and the second that I committed to my music, I thought it was going to turn around right away. And it wasn't until later that he got presented an opportunity that changed his, his whole music career pretty much sure. at that point. Right. And it's all because of the back catalog that he had. It was all based off the work that he was putting in consistently over and over and over. And there was no results at the, at that moment. Right. And it, that happens to a lot of brands, a lot of businesses where, you know, certain, especially in this generation where a lot of things are felt like it should happen overnight. You know, yo, if I do this for a few weeks, I'm gonna blow up, boom, right? Yo, if, if, if I post for a whole month, I'm gonna get all these different followers, I'm gonna be able to monetize my brand, everything's gonna sell out, we're gonna be good because this person did it and it's great, right? Majority of things don't happen overnight. And if, you, if you've seen the pattern of the, the greats that we keep bringing up, they've worked years before certain opportunities presented itself, right? They worked, they invested, whether it was time or money, they sacrificed, whether it was family or just mental space and everything like that, for to finally, years down the line, it pay off, right? We, we went over um, Jay-Z, shout out to all the, the YouTube uh, subscribers because they're, they're seeing those clips, right? Where every record label he went to, they said no. They said he was horrible. This is not happening, right? And he, he had to do it by himself with, with two of his closest friends, right? Nip took that same path. Yo, you know what? I'm, I'm going to just keep moving. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to do this. And it finally paid off where even he was like, nah, I ain't even about the music anymore. They're like, nah, hold on. If you don't want to figure it out, let me grab some of your old stuff because it's that fire. And let me present you with a contract. So Moose, um, what, what was your thoughts about the clip? And like, how do you, how do you, what is one or two things that can help getting over those obstacles and continue to work? Yeah. Yeah. I, th the first one off the bat, embrace the calling, embrace the calling, right? Maybe at the time when they came to him, he wasn't as involved in music but you don't build such a strong, powerful body of work if if in that season of life, he embraced the calling, he was dedicated to his craft, he was doing everything that he had to do, and organically, even if it wasn't embraced at the time, it it, it brought about the fruit of the labor, right? Like, it, it really caught up to him. And I noticed when you don't embrace the calling, that was something I had to check myself on, especially in this season, right? It's like my excuse all the time was, ah, you know, I just don't like to create my own content or I'm too self-critical. I'm a perfectionist. I, I All of this. And, oh, I, I should hire people. And then when I embrace the calling, I, I've hired people that I'm not even utilizing because now I'm noticing the energy get generated where I'm doing my own stuff now. That I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to wait. Wait a minute. Thing. Wait, wait a minute. That's big. Embrace the calling. That's yeah. Big. You embrace the calling and then all of a sudden you notice you're starting to get energy for things that you normally wouldn't enjoy. And we, we've talked about this. So I'm just like, man, something special happens when you just say, you know what? I understand that so-and-so may not agree or like what I'm about to do, but I'm dedicating my life to this. I'm going all in. I don't want no other options or alternative. This is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, something special begins to happen from an energy standpoint, from an attraction standpoint, in terms of who you begin to attract into your life, from a response standpoint, even how people begin to respond to you. So in short, Nikki, all I would say here is this concept of embrace the calling. 
everything on the everything that you're looking for is on the other side of that consistency discipline right all of those things creativity the, the resourcefulness all of those things come out when you embrace the calling that you're just giving yourself almost like a no way out i'm, I'm jumping if the parachute don't open whatever this is the call that i've taken on so i noticed that's just something that you hear in his tone it's like you know unfortunately they didn't embrace me back then and i had to make a move because circumstances called for it mm -hmm. however because i was dedicated during that time Look what happens. Now someone from the label comes back, gives him an opportunity that really without the music, you could make an argument that it wouldn't be as big as we know it to be today. Because in some of his interviews, he talks about his inspiration of looking at a, a Jay-Z and a P. Diddy yep. with them using the music to then go to clothing and then go into other ventures. Everything kind of pivoted off of the music. So it's like, you know, I'm grateful that that he did that at one point because without that music, we don't get to see him for what he is today. So, uh, yeah. Sheesh. Um, I, I don't have to say much. I'm just gonna go to the next one. I just, I, nope, <laughs> not gonna do it. Um, this is gonna be my favorite, one of my favorite ones out of the, I think three left hopefully. But this is one of my favorite ones. <laughs> I just believe in ownership. Yeah. You know what I mean? I believe in, you know, um, investing in yourself. When you make money, you know, you can easily go a lot of places. No box money is, you know, when you own an asset and you get the, you know, the, the income that the asset generates, we call it mailbox yeah, money. Man. You own real yeah, estate, you get mailbox just go money. To the, just go there and it's, yeah. it's one waiting on you. Period. Like, oh, okay, yeah. hello. And if you, if you own publishing, you write your own records, and you ain't sold your publishing, that's mailbox money. You get mm -hmm. your, you own your masters when them albums sell on iTunes, that's mailbox money. Yeah, man. And that's the, that's the business model of every major corporation. <sighs> so look, this is... Actually, I'm gonna let Moose go. I'm gonna let Moose go because I, I don't think I'm gonna give um I don't think I'm gonna give him a, a shot. So I'm gonna let Moose go. Moose, what did you think of the clip? Um, this is this is all business talk now. So this is your vibe. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know me and you've had multiple conversations about the ownership situations. Um, yeah, give give your take. Yeah, for sure. I, I think definitely somebody who was ahead of his time with this concept, right? And not so much when the clip was recorded, but when he started, right? Like I, one of my favorite clips is of a very young Nipsey Hussle when he's talking about real estate yep. and, and, and acquiring assets and not liabilities. And it's like, wait, this is the 90s. Like this is before the internet boom and the information world that we live in today. But He's ahead of his time with the concept. But to give you an example of what it did for him today, and I want to just throw it right back to you because I'm actually excited to hear what you got to say about this. Mm -hmm. Another artist who we look at, maybe not in hip hop so much, but definitely in music as an icon, Prince, mm. believed in this strategy so much so that he would not collaborate with other artists if they were tied to a label. Mm. Because he knew that if they were tied to a label, then he couldn't have ownership of the records. So there was even like a modern day example of a song that he was working on with Nas. Yep. Nas is one of those artists who messed up and is tied to a label. And he he cut he cut the music. He cut the production because he said, if I can't have ownership because your own your, your label's involved, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. But then fast forward to today. Of course, unfortunately, we know Nip is one of those examples who even at the limelight in 2018, 2019, he still didn't get the full reward for his work and who he was. People really embraced him in his passing. Yeah. But just look at the numbers. After his passing in the 12 months to follow, from music alone, his streams on Amazon went up by 500,000%. Mm. Okay? His album sales went up by 2000%. Overall in those 12 months, Nikki, 1.8 billion streams. You talk, about, you talk about legacy and all of this other stuff. 
that ownership mentality is what allows him and his family to benefit off of that body of work. Mm -hmm. Facts, all facts. But could could they have benefit if he was on a record label? Probably not. So here is where I go a little bit. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try because I still got like two more. I got two more. I promise you. Um, so this is the thing. Let Let's look at because if we're gonna talk about the music and a lot of people based off you know, because of the passing and everything, pretty much caught on to Victory Lap, right? Mm -hmm. They may not have listened to the mixtapes prior, but Victory Lap was a whole vibe, right? And the lyrics was all gems and everything like that. I'm not getting too much into it as far as that was a partnership with Atlantic. That wasn't him being on a record label. They did a distribution deal, right? Where Nip was uh, signed to All Money In Records and All Money In and Atlantic had a distribution deal where Atlantic would put it out on Apple, Spotify, all that great stuff, the utilizing the machine of the record label without those lame 360 deals or getting a cut of the touring and all that great stuff. Listen, I need the machine as far as getting myself, my stuff out there, the connections that you have, let's work that out. But I'm a platform all on its own. Right. And that deal actually took quite a while to uh, establish. Hence why his album took forever to come out. But he was not going to budge because he wanted to own the masters to all his music where people jump on giving the rights to whether it's their content, their their creativity, their their art, whatever it is, anything that they have, if they can get on a platform, they're going to give it up, whether it's equity, whatever it is just to be on that platform and nip had created so much already he knew his value he was like i just need you to do this and i'm not budging i've had other record labels come to me and i've said no because it didn't make sense he had rick ross at the time was one of the one of the top uh record executives at mmg all that great stuff he had his own uh distribution deal and everything right it made sense for rick ross and nipsey to come together and nip said nah because i i love what rick ross is doing but I know the platform that I have. I know the impact that I'm trying to do. I know the empire I'm trying to create. I can't do that being owned by somebody else. My stuff being owned by somebody else, right? He was, he taught the importance of regardless, like in the other clips, regardless of what you have, you own that and you build it. Because if you don't build it, there, your value won't go up. You allow other people to give you what you're worth. He was like, I'm setting these numbers and this is what it is. That's why he can charge 100. That's why he could har uh, charge 1,000. That's why he could charge whatever for his touring. That's why he, d I paid 100 and some dollars for this jersey. We all know these jerseys do not cost this much. I bought three of them. Right. I'll do it all over all again. Right. Right. He has a hat. This is not this one, but he has a hat. That's one hundred dollars. The all money in logo. Anything with the all money in logo is a hundred plus. Right. Mm -hmm. I went and this is this is a, a real situation. So around what was it like Christmas time or something where the the um, the pop up shop in New York was. Do you remember what when oh, that yeah, was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was definitely it was winter. cold. I, it was cold, yeah. okay? So, <laughs> oh my goodness, that was cold. So, um, they did a pop-up shop. Mind you, Marathon Clothing is is in LA, 
right? Now, ever since his passing, that shop has not been open at all, right? Everything has been through online. And after his passing, did you say those numbers after his passing, how much they made uh, the marathon million. clothing? Huh? 10, mil 10 million. Yeah, $10 million. After his passing, yeah, that store went crazy. The, the, and shout out to Dyson. Dyson got me this whole, uh, this whole marathon suit. It was fire, right? Um, but that took like four months to get, right? So wow. it was around winter time, and they did a, a pop-up in New York. And so I went, right? I stood in line for over four hours, cold, cr crying wow. inside, freezing, okay? Um, and when I went inside, it wasn't about the money. It was about the experience. It was about the support. I knew where this money was going, right? I knew this was going to his family. I knew this was going to something bigger than uh, retail or whatever. This was for the brand. All the money was going back. There's something for supporters that it, it gives a, it wants us to give you the money once we know you own it all. Right. If there's other people involved, other entity, it's it, we love you, but I don't know if I'll stay four hours there. And no matter what the price was I, and, and pay it, the shirt was uh, one was fifty dollars. One was one hundred dollars. The hoodie was about a hundred and something. I, I spend well over a thousand dollars that day. And I think I came out with wow. like five things. I promise you. I think it was like five. I think the cheapest thing was a lighter and I don't even smoke. But it said Crenshaw. <laughs> and so I have four of them. Um, so all in all, I'm, I'm saying that because I had no problem paying that because I knew it was all going to his, his ownership, to his family and all that great stuff. Right? And... What he did when it came to the whole marathon clothing, right? Going back to LA, he owned that whole block. Yeah. Where the the place that he died, he owned that whole lot. From a place that he was hustling in when he was younger to going and owning the whole block. To be able to, it was a bigger thing. It wasn't about money. It was like, yo, I want to give back to the community, mm -hmm. right? I want to provide jobs. I want to provide, there was a fish uh, shop or something like that, a fish store. And he's like, yo, we're going to make the fish healthier. Like we're going to cook it in a healthier way because people in this community um, know to like we know hamburgers and fried stuff and everything like that yeah. on this block i'm going to um i'm going to make this healthy right with the marathon uh clothing store i'm going to make this and i'm, I'm going to get into that in a little bit i'm going i'm going to make this into a whole experience that you've never exper that you never had right he had a partnership with Fat Burger, anything that was around there, he either owned or he had a partnership with. There wasn't yeah. much that he was doing. There, I don't think there was anything that he was doing that he didn't have equity in. And so we have to look at that and be like, yo, people own this of me, own my time, own like I'm renting, I'm doing this, like even little things like that. Like, yo, do you rent or you do you own? Like, he made you think of everything different. I'm not looking, and me and Moose have this conversation. I'm not looking because of Nipsey's teaching at a flat check no more. I'm not interested in that. I'm looking at a percentage. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at equity. I'm not looking at, yo, can I make a quick, thousand two three thousand and no i'm not interested in that let's do this together but it has to be a percentage in it I, there has it has to be worth my while at this moment because 
in the past, I've done too much work for to sit here and say what you gave me was enough. I don't think that's true. And some people are okay with that, and that's cool. But looking at taking something that he had a passion for, which was, uh, which was music, to be able to take whatever he gets from that, from the resources, from the tours and all that, and, and reinvest it in buying the block, reinvesting in the community. We're doing elementary schools and giving out sneakers to students and things like that. Reinvesting and doing Vector 90, where Moose will go into that. I'm not going to go too much into it. I don't want to. I could OD. I know this. Um, and, and putting not money only into his family, into his businesses, but also into the community. You can't do that if you don't own anything. You can't do that. Let me let me, let me ask you a question too, real quick. Do you think that? Um, you know, just kind of using the example of what you talked about in terms of how you willingly spent on product that yep. you know is overpriced, overpriced and you were okay with it. Do you think that, and I'm not saying it's not worth it or valuable, but I'm just saying, do you think that that's because it, it, it makes it more important for brands and businesses today to really give the backstory of who they are, what they do with the money? Do you think that helped you make your purchasing decision and is that important for other brands and businesses to do the same thing today um i don't know if necessarily what they will do with the money per se like if that helps helps um because now now i will say this people will buy for a cause right so and this is a given stat. We we looked up this stat. Man, this is why you're the stat guy. And I can't remember no stats. But there is a stat. You can look it up. It's on Google, right? Um, where if you get a shirt and you just sell that out, $20, right? Boom. That might make a certain amount, depending on how you brand it and all that great stuff, right? But if you put a cause to it, whether it is, uh, you know, starving children in Somalia. I don't know why I keep saying Somalia for some reason. But starving kids in Somalia, right? Um, you know, and all these other different, co- the, the pandemic with the, the essential workers, all that great stuff, right? Yes. That will sell more because we know where it's going to, right? We know that our hard-earned money is going to the right reasons right we don't yeah. necessarily care about your monetary goals we care about where to an extent on in this example we care where it's going to right mm-hmm. now after his death it played a big role right because we knew Anything that we buy in the store today, all the streams, everything like that is going to his family, right? It's going to what he created, right? Now, before, it was all about support. You've done so much in the community. You've you've employed thousands of people. You bought the block. You turned something that was negative at some point. Police rage, uh, drug dealing, all that stuff. And you wiped it out and you created something of that was all about gangbanging into something that people could come to now. Tourist people can come to and have no issues, right? Yeah. We have to give something to that because we know you are the truth. We know that... What you do with the money is going to be for a bigger cause, right? He, he didn't even have to say all what was being done because honestly, his work came out after he died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. that he was well, doing didn't necessarily come. Like we found out um, a few minutes. Actually, I knew this before, but in details, he had a meeting with the LAPD the f- next day after he died, like if he was if he was alive the following day, he had a meeting with the LAPD to uh, reduce gang violence 
and to help out the kids further with their education and stuff like that, right? He had a lot of things tied with the community and the culture as hip hop in general as well, that we knew that he was a leader. Like we knew that. He knew ownership was important because if I didn't own, how could people take me serious about being a leader? If I don't own anything, you can't take me serious. Like, great, I have impact, but I can't really lead people if I don't have ownership in this and that. And that. like, we look at a Diddy different. We look at a Dre different. We look at certain people different because we know they own certain things. Once there's a, uh, a problem, Nick Cannon, we look at you funny. We're like, wait, what? Hold on. Wow. Yeah. It, 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 the impact lowers a little bit because we right. thought you owned it and you honestly don't. It got taken away from you. So how can you lead with, with nothing to hold on to? You're leading them to what? To give them to somebody else? Yeah. 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 That's, that's good. And, and you know, too, when you own something, you have a bigger fight. Right. You don't allow anyone to take it away from you because you've put so much time, effort, energy, money, everything yep. into building it that you don't allow it to do it. You know, one of the lessons that I learned from this clip, too, just in learning more about his business partner. And, and you know, I shared that video with you like this changes our entire strategy of how we move forward because this was major. But he talks about this concept of all money in, no money out. Facts. And every Every venture that he starts, the cause generates profits and the profits are used to streamline something else, Mm -hmm. usually around community and culture. That's what he prioritized in all his stuff, right? It's like, I love that conversation where he's talking with someone about Jay-Z's last album and he's like, oh, well, you know, uh, it, it wasn't really that successful. He says, well, number wise, and he was like, well, it don't matter. Culturally, it was received very well. And and that's the only thing that he rates his success by. Right. So all money in, no money out. He takes the money from the marathon mm-hmm. uh, sc- uh, clothing, all the profits that were uh, raised during that year, the year after his passing. They take it and they put it into another fund capitalizing on a law talks about opportunity zones. And for those interested in real estate, definitely look into this law because it's a real tangible thing that both parties agreed on opportunity zones, which allows you to get use capital gains and get tax benefits during your investment. And even shortly thereafter uh, on, on properties that you acquire during the time, of course, in, in low income neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are on the rise. So what does he do? Right. And his business partner is carrying that under his name now. Mm -hmm. But I just really love that everything is connected to something else that cycles back to the people. And I think with with everything that you're doing, if if the end result is always giving to others or making sure that people benefit as well, it's like you'll never run out of things to do or energy to keep doing it. You know, so I, I love that concept and just wanted to tie it in with that with that piece as well. All right, before I go on another rant, I need to get into this next clip because I'm seeing the time. I, and I appreciate everybody who's been chilling with us. If you haven't shared, if you haven't commented, do both. Uh, let's get into the experience now. Every product, every logo on the wall, there's a section where there's art on the wall. Every tag on each product is programmed with content. So there's content on the tags right now. And so once you make a purchase, you know, you take the product home, there's an app you download, Mm -hmm. the Marathon Store app, and you can put the actual phone to the tag of the clothes Mm -hmm. and the content will stream. What that'll do is, let's say I got a song with a big artist, Mm -hmm. and instead of giving it to Apple Music or giving it to a streaming site to... You can stream it exclusively in the store. Yeah, I can can attach it to a product and say Mm -hmm. you can get the the song available three days before it come out officially if you come buy this t-shirt. So, wow. experience and ownership. Again, 
Let's talk about it. So, um, for for those who may have been a little bit lost, um, he had one uh, flagship store in L.A., which was the block that we were talking about, right? Um, and it was the first smart store ever, ever. So he had gotten with this uh, coder and that he met in Starbucks, right? And they created this technology that everything that you scan, like you put your phone near a shirt, uh, uh, an artwork, a logo, whatever, right? Exclusive content would come up, right? Whether it's a music video, whether it is an exclusive song, hearing his whole album before it even came out, he created, he uses technology that was before its time and uh, a retail experience like no other to create this flagship store. Now, understand, e-commerce and, and everything booming, right? Some people would have probably looked at that and be like, yo, why are you creating a actual store when you could do this online and kill it, right? And give it to your fans that are throughout the world, right? This is, this is a great example of creating a difference between physical and virtual, right? To most, retail is dead, physical, right? But he, while he was alive, right, showed different. All you have to do is create a different experience compared to what people deal with online. I cannot scan this and get that same experience as if I was at the flagship store, right? There's certain content depending on the location that would only mm -hmm. come up where I would have to fly to LA to get that experience compared to buying it, right? Two different experiences. So when you're looking at uh, creating a product, uh, virtual or physical, what is the difference? That's what's going to be the difference between how much you charge, what do you do? Even in, from a virtual event to a physical event, those are two different yeah. price points, period, yeah. right? And he used technology and his brand that he's already created, right? And through that brand, then he had partnerships with a Jay-Z when it came to planes, right? They dropped an exclusive hat. He did a partnership with Puma that I think I bought that whole line. Um Another very expensive thing in my, I, I promise you, he has all my money. It's the <laughs> craziest thing. Um, but he had a partnership with Puma, right? Um, everything based off what he's built for himself, he's been able to open up different opportunities. And now people want to create smart stores just like him. His whole plan for the store, right, uh, before his passing was to actually create multiple locations because he wanted to do the proud to pay campaigns in each of these stores. So yeah. if he had one pop up and it sold out and he made a uh, hundred K imagine if he had multiple ones in California, in New York, in Atlanta, right in Miami all these different hotspots finally giving them access to a Nipsey experience, he was going to make millions off of a retail store that if anybody else was to create would fail. But he used technology and a retail experience and combined it with his own style, his own swag from what he's already created from a table and and slanging shirts and socks outside of that same exact block that now he owned, right? Improvements. <sighs> Improvements. <sighs> Improvements. <laughs> you know, you know, 
you know what I love about this concept, right? Mm. Because people say that, uh, okay, uh, physical locations are dying, right? And like mm-hmm. you said, kind of uh, retail is dying. Yep. True. But you know what's on the rise? Mm. Social media experiences. Mm-hmm. So they're even here in the city in New York. I forget. It's, it's I think it's like the Champagne Mansion, something like that. Okay. There's like a couple of different experiences where they rent out a large warehouse, Mm -hmm. right? And they just do pop-ups where it's nothing more but different cool looking rooms for people to walk through and do what? And take pictures for their social media. Mm -hmm. So yes, while the physical is dying, understand the concept behind it, that there's a trade-off that he utilizes very in a very brilliant way. He says, well, the trade-off is if you come to the store, number one, Yes, you're going to experience the store and and have things to post on your social. And it may seem shallow, but that's just how business is done today, right? People go to places because they want to create content. They want to experience something. They want to share with their friends what they're up to. How can I leverage that from a business standpoint? Well, let me create the experience in store. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do a trade-off again by giving value. You hear him talk about If you come in and you get this tag, then you can get access maybe to the song three or four days before it comes out. There's the trade off, the the right, like the the advantage that you get as being a part of the experience. And then, of course, you also walk away with the merchandise. So the entire cycle, when you think about strategy, the entire cycle of the strategy and the experience, it it fills the next bucket, right? Like one fu- one bucket fills the next bucket, which which I thought was brilliant. And it's crazy because he even said in that same interview that it's not just for that moment. So like three months later, like if he can change up certain things and say, yo, that that uh, blue uh, jersey that you bought, take it out of the, the hamper real quick, scan it, I just put up a new video. Like he understood the importance of technology. If you listen to Mailbox Money, right? This is actual mixtape, not just the theory of it, right? The actual mixtape. Um, one of the songs at the end of it, he said, "Yo, this is uh th- the day and age that we're in with technology. This is the new gold rush, right? This is the new gold rush, and this was." years ago this was years ago like he was ahead of his time that store was ahead of its time right the fact that years later if he was still alive he could be like yo whoever has the original crenshaw shirts um scan it real quick i just released a whole new album just for you guys what no one else was doing it. Now everybody is starting to do that. Everybody has that, yo, scan your book, and then I have a whole new kind of thing. That's cool. I'm with it, right? Mm-hmm. But Nip did that. Nip created yeah. that experience and owned that technology. And the crazy thing about it, and going back to the ownership thing, is that every concept that he thought, he owned it, and then he tried to duplicate it for others. So the Proud to Pay campaign, like I said, he created a uh, agency, a marathon agency, right, with Karen Civil, his photographer, and some other guy, right, to be able to do that for other artists, right? Now, um, with the, the technology for the marathon clothing, him and the coder, I think his name was Idris, I forgot, it starts with an I, right? Um, they created something that that was going to be for other retail stores as well, for other big brands. They were already in talks of that. Of course, with his music, he created all money uh, records, right? So everything that he was doing, there was an agency, there was a campaign, even from um, everything was marathon something, Marathon Clothing, uh, Marathon OG, Marathon Agency, everything that he was doing, had he had ownership in. And so if he thought it, if he had an idea, he tried it on himself, and then he wanted it to duplicate it for others. So I look at that like, yo, our ideas can be so much bigger 
than just what's in our head or than maybe yeah. a simple post. Like everything that we do can truly create an empire if we just perfect it with ourselves first. Try it, experiment first, get it all together, get the systems right, all that great stuff. And then the money comes in when you could duplicate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I'll add this real quick before our next video. Wealth is accumulated on repeat business. I, I spin it however wait much a way minute. You want. Wait, wait a minute. Yeah, spin it however which way you want. But if you're constantly have to start over every single day, every single week, every single month, having to chase after new customers, mm -hmm. the minute the minute something happens to you, your business goes out the window. Wealth is accumulated on being able to get repeat business from people, whether it be word of mouth referrals, whether it's because, like you said, they purchase a product or service from one bucket, but then you release another version of it in this area. So they're interconnected. Right. So it's like that concept. And you start to see that ecosystem that he has where you start to get everything that you want. From an experience standpoint, from an entertainment standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, it's like one stop shop all within that same umbrella, which is really cool. Right. Right. I'm being mindful of the time. I got one more clip and this uh this clip was because I know I I could OD on this topic. So I found one that made me completely uh, think about Moose, because we all know Moose is super deep, right? All the bars that he says is beyond deep. So I had to find a deep bar that he could dissect because it's only right. So this is what I came up with. I think as human beings, everybody has a natural gift and a natural passion. But then you go outside and you get influenced and you, and you feel pressure from, from what's going on outside. And so, you know, I read one time, like, would you rather be at war with yourself and at peace with the world mm -hmm. or at peace with yourself and at war with the world? Mm -hmm. And that was powerful for me. My, my, my. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Sheesh. Moose. That's major. That is major. You have no idea. I get so amped about hearing people of influence talk about this concept because we can sometimes really go on a rampage and start to think that, oh, people, celebrities, artists, they're not conscious. They're not woke. They don't know what they're doing. It's, it's all a facade. And then you hear someone speak such truth and from a, a, a powerful place of intelligence, it just kind of stops you in your track, right? One of the things I was thinking about today is that while – Yes, we're trained to go after what we don't do well. We also always downplay what we do well because we don't think that it can possibly be that easy. And notice he starts the clip off by saying everyone has a natural gift. But when we're programmed by the world that it can't possibly be that easy, then you overlook your natural gift because you're like, oh, no, it's not it. Everyone says you got to work hard. And it's like, yeah, you work hard. To, to refine it, to make it better, but you don't ignore what comes natural to you. And then that other piece, it's that when you go from self to others now, when you're caught up in others and you start in the rever reverse order, you're concerned about the approval or the acceptance of others. So you're constantly doing things. And there's another interview where he talks about, I judge people based on their intention. So if the execution is wrong or it comes off a little twisted, I'm like, wait, 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 before I judge you, what was your intention? Oh, you have pure motives? I'm not going to be mad at you. I can't, you know, be upset at you because I know your intentions were pure. Mm -hmm. So when, when your intentions are now, let me do this so that I can get this type of attention so that maybe one of my posts can go viral so that this person can respond to me so that I can get this type of attraction, right? You're constantly doing things for others. And sure, they may accept you at some point, but you, then you, you, you really lose the battle because you're still at war with yourself. So it's just such a powerful thing. And it's like when you put it that way in such a simple way, the choice 
becomes very simple. It's like, no, let me be at peace with myself. That's a priceless investment. You know, so I, I absolutely love that we're closing with this here because it's just timeless, timeless. I had, I had to get, I had to hit, get those bars. I had to get those bars. Look, um, I know we're over and everything like that, but I think not only because clearly his birthday is Saturday. Shout out to all the the Leos in the building. Um, but normally we always go um, and highlight legends that are still alive, right? Um, but this one is close to me because he has really helped shape the movement that I'm doing at this moment um, from everything from the branding talk um, to where I actually got his source of where he's getting all this branding talk. I follow that guy. That's a whole different movement, right? Um, from his business lessons to his mindset, um, you can learn a lot from Nip, um, especially from a business standpoint. Um, the, the biggest thing, like I said, is is the ownership. There was one thing, and it's funny, um, and then we could go, like, uh, he's big on the real estate, but he was also talking about stocks and everything, and one of the uh, people who were interviewing him was like, Okay, what is some of the um, what is some of the advice that you would give people to invest? Like, so you're saying do real estate, do real estate, and he's like, look, if your passion and your heart's in it, do real estate. If your thing is in stocks, do stocks. If your thing is in tech, do tech. Like, you you have to have an interest and a uh, you know a passion somewhat for what you're putting your money into, not just for a bag, but really because you're going to be owning this. So yeah. if you don't have a, a interest or a love for what you're owning, what is the point of it, right? Um, so that right there was confirmation for a few for certain things that me and Moose were talking about because I'm like yeah. now on this whole stock, stock, stocks. Everybody's like real estate. And I'm like, yeah, that bores me. Um, but I know it has to happen. But right now, what is going to keep my interest in everything? So little lessons like that, right, from investments to ownership to experience, to just having full confidence in yourself and, and going all in on your life, your beliefs, your uh, value and everything like that. Nip just created a whole culture that I wish he would have saw like grow because his death, I think, woke a lot of people up into who they truly were because they truly have to live up to the whole the marathon continues because it doesn't stop with his death. Like some of the books that he's read, some of the beliefs that he has, some of the business ventures still have to go on, right? So I challenge everybody to just pick up one thing, whether it's from... This uh, episode, whether it's from your own findings with Nip, right? Pick one thing and just let that carry on because a legacy like that shouldn't die from how it did, right? His, there's too many gems. There's too many bars. L like I said, listen to Victory Lap. Listen to Crenshaw. Listen to Mailbox Money. Listen to all his other mixtapes and not necessarily for just the party or club or street lyrics, listen to the gems that he's giving. He's giving gems about investments. He's giving gems about equity. He's giving gems about technology way before it's time that when you listen to it now, it's still a little bit before it's time. So uh, Moose, you can end it out, but I wanted to just say that like that, that whole 
like what Nip has done for me as far as my brand, as far as who I am, like I have to make sure each year there is a lesson like this. Shout out to those people who follow me on Instagram because on the anniversary of his death, we did, we dedicated a whole week of it, right? So at least that with each platform that I'm going to be able on, and thank you for allowing this episode to happen, Moose, like every episode I, I'm able to get on, if one person can grab just a new lesson from it, then like he says, the marathon continues.